Energy Research Solid Computing Center. So uh, you have the relevant loops in front of you for your feedback and questions, if you have any. So since this presentation is going to be, we'll have three presenters for this webinar. It's likely that eventual questions will be answered almost in, in time, real time. So uh, with that, Python and HPC, uh, the speakers will be Roland Thomas from NERSC, William Scullin from uh, Argonne, and Matt Bohorn from uh, uh, Oak Ridge. Uh, Roland, please take the podium. I'm going to start sharing the slides. Sherry, can you confirm that you can see the slides okay? Yes, I can see them. All right, great. All right, thank you everybody for calling in. My name is Roland Thomas. I'm from the Data and Analytics Services Group here at NERSC. I'm going to be leading the first part of the webinar today, and then William's going to take over the, the second half. And Matt has kindly agreed to manage questions inside the chat. Um, we're going to stop periodically to handle questions um, and Matt's going to um, send us kind of the, the top level questions and maybe answer some of the other questions in real time. So I'd like to start by setting the scope of the webinar here today. What we want to do when we were preparing these slides is we wanted to expl explain what uh, NERSC, ALCF, and OLCF are doing to welcome and support Python users in HPC, provide guidance and best practices so that users can improve Python performance at the various centers, and also point out some great tools that now exist that support developers of Python applications and high-performance computing. So what we're going to assume in the course of this talk is that you know and use Python and are familiar with the scientific Python stack yourself, and also that you, or you know and use high-performance computing and are curious about what Python can do for you in your own HPC work. Oh, as we advance, I'm going to try to remember to say the, the number of the slide for those of you following along on the phone. Sorry if I, if I don't do it on every slide. So slide three. Uh, those of you who are completely new to Python, um, for you, we've provided some links to help you get started in Python. And what we recommend is that you might want to go through some of those slides and come back to this webinar, the recorded webinar, and the slides later. Um, so we're, we're not going to really get into the basics of Python today. The agenda for today's talk, shown on slide four here, is divided into four main parts. First, we'll discuss the motivation for this talk, why is Python relevant to HPC in the first place, discuss some practical matters about how you can get started using Python at NERSC, Argonne, and Oak Ridge. Uh, then we'll talk about um, single node performance for Python, that is basically how Python works on a single node, and then how you can scale up your Python applications in high performance computing centers. And at the end, we'll provide a few more resources for you to follow up with. Again, we're going to pause for maybe one to two questions at each break point in the talk, and Matt will manage the Q&A via the chat. So we'll begin with the motivation on slide six. It goes without saying that Python is a very popular language in general today to learn. Um, if you go to Google, you ask a question like, what programming language should I start learning, or what programming languages are good for doing data science, what programming languages are widely used in industry or machine learning uh, or coding challenges, Python almost always comes back, uh, if not at the top, probably in the top five programming languages that people are using today. Slide seven. So why is Python popular? What has driven its adoption um, in general? Uh, I think that there are, are really two things here that are key. First is that Python makes a tremendously great first impression to, to programmers. It has a very clean, clear syntax. Uh, after a while, the white space is actually very nice. Um, it's a multi-paradigm programming language, meaning that, well, it's basically an object-oriented programming language. Everything is an object, but if you like to do imperative programming, or you are fond of functional programs, there are constructs there for you to make use of. 
is an interpreted programming language, which means that you don't spend a lot of time compiling big applications. Uh, but in HPC, uh, using Python, you may do some compilation, in fact. Um, it gets a lot of the uh, overhead out of the way. Cognitive burden is moved away from the user in terms of making sure that uh, dynamic typing is used properly. Um, there isn't a static typing system really in Python. Man and memory management is, is, is taken care of for the user. So people's first impression basically is that I have instant productivity and by the end of the first day of learning Python, people are writing actual usable Python programs. But Python is useful beyond the first day. It's not just a language for teaching people how to code. Um, it provides a flexible, full-featured set of data structures, lists, dictionaries, sets, iterators, all kinds of wonderful building blocks for building bigger applications. It includes an extensive set of uh, standard libraries, and there is a large reusable um, set of open source packages available on the web for you to use. Also, uh, in the past five or ten years, the package management system for Python has really come a long way, and so installing packages is fairly easy. Um, there are a number of very excellent uh, unit testing frameworks for developing larger applications, uh, and in fact, the continuous integration world is really set up for, for Python unit testing in a really great way. Probably most important for this talk is that Python is extensible with C, C++, or Fortran code, to optimize high performance kernels. Um, so it's possible to link in to a Python application code that is compiled so that you can achieve the best performance that you can get for certain computational kernels. So you have instant productivity and performance when you need it. Slide eight. So this is the basis, or I guess the foundation of the scientific Python stack is a lot of the compiled code that's been out there for maybe the past 30 or 40 years has been incorporated into a number of libraries that are very useful and accessible to uh, Python programmers through Python's very nice interfaces. What we've observed is that the primary uses of Python in general at a high performance computing center falls under scripting workflows for both data analysis and simulations, but also performing exploratory or interactive data analytics and visualization at various scales. And the, the scientific Python stack is really the basis for doing this. Slide nine. So what about Python at the High Performance Computing Center? Our first observation, of course, was that Python was basically a productivity language. That is, high productivity is what has driven the growth of Python in general, but this is also true in the sciences. In terms of performance, this has not really been the driver. Um, but Python users are showing up at our centers um, more and more, and so supporting Python is no longer an option. Not supporting Python is, is, is no longer an option in high-performance centers like NERSC or AFI. So what does that mean for us? Um, maximizing Python's performance on the systems that we run is pretty challenging. Um, there are a number of reasons for this. Three of them are listed here. The first is that, of course, interpreted dynamic languages can be very difficult to optimize for decisions till runtime instead of um, making them in at compile time. Um, Python has a controversial feature called the global interpreter lock. And I think the most neutral thing I can say about it is that that has consequences for parallelism in Python. And we'll talk about a few of those. So for all Python language design and its implementation choices, actually how the interpreter works were made without really considering the realities of, of high performance computing. Slide 10. That said, there is very clearly a place for Python and high level languages in general, I would say, at the highest levels of performance in supercomputing. And as an existence proof um, is, is PyFR, which was uh, a Gordon Bell and a SE16 best for finalist submitted last year. Um, basically, this is a, a performance, uh, an application whose performance portability was enabled by Python and used novel code generation techniques to, to make uh, computational fluid dynamics manageable from a, a single code base targeting CPUs and GPU architectures. And this was done with just a few thousand lines of Python code. Okay. In general, we would like to emphasize that there are maybe a few basic guidelines that people could take away from this talk. 
And the, the top one is probably that in order to be to get the most out of Python in a high performance computing context, it's important for users to try to identify and exploit parallelism at the core, node, and cluster levels. And we're going to show you some easy things you can do to do that and talk about um, some slightly more advanced techniques that you can use to, to push that even further. Um, a, second, a second point is that users of Python should really come to understand and apply NumPy's array syntax and understand its broadcast controls. We're not going to talk about that here. That's covered in great detail in a number of other places, and we've provided uh, two of the main documents here. Simply applying NumPy's array syntax and broadcasting rules will get you pretty far, because a lot of the scientific Python stack uh, underneath that is already threaded when, you, uh, when you're able to do this. Um, third, we would like to encourage users to do a bit more profiling of their codes measuring their code's performance using actual profiling tools. Um, just sticking in time calls is probably okay to get started, but we're going to show you a few tools that you might consider using to go to the next step. And of course, you should always ask for help if you get stuck. We're here to help you. And in fact, from users, we learn a lot of techniques that we can pass along to other users. All right, so I'm on slide 12 now. And this is a break point, and so I'm going to ask Matt, are there any questions at this point? So if, there's, if there aren't, I'll just move on. Ron, we're, we have no questions at this point. Thank you. All right, so the next part of the talk, starting on slide 12, is about how to get started with Python at Maersk in the leadership class facilities. On slide 13, we show you the basic basic point, which is that Python, just like a lot of other software packages at, at these centers, is provided through uh, environment, environment modules. Um, environment modules provide a way for you to dynamically modify your environment through something called module files. Basically, this is a way to manipulate uh, paths, library paths, so that you're able to um, add or remove um, software from your, uh, from your environment. So this is the primary way that, that, that we as staff provide Python to users. However, in all cases, we also allow or encourage even users to install their own Python stack. And there are a number of options for doing this to discuss. However, one key thing that everybody should keep in mind, and occasionally we still see users doing this, is that uh, system Python, which you know you could probably identify as something like user bin Python on any given system, on the supercomputers, that's something that you use at your own risk. Um, it's frequently out of date, um, and we don't build packages against it to provide to users in a general sense. Okay, so that's kind of there for system administration purposes and not for general user use. So stick to the module. On slide 14, how do we build Python and distribute it to users? We have a number of ways of doing that. We may build and install Python and, and its packages directly from source, but that we're doing that less and less, and we're switching to tools like package managers like SPAC, or using the distribution of Python like Anaconda or Intel, or you can kind of consider them the both uh, both the same thing, or we may provide them all the same, uh, all of the above. We also allow, as I mentioned before, use, uh, users to set up their own Python stack. Of course, if you want to build the whole thing from source or use SPAC, you can absolutely do that. Um, if you want to use Anaconda or the Intel um, distribution for Python, there are ways of doing that also that we'll talk about. Um, but there are a couple of things that people should keep in mind. First of all, any package that depends on MPI, so MPI for Pi being one, H5Pi possibly being another, should always be built against a uh, system vendor provided uh, MPI library. So here at NERSC, that's the Cray input. Um, the Anaconda distribution, people should know, comes with the uh, Intel math kernel library basically built in. And uh, conversely, the Intel distribution heavily leverages Anaconda tools. So you can manage an Intel Python distribution using Anaconda tools. Slide 15, how can users customize their Python environment? There are two main ways that we're going to discuss. The first one is virtual end. Virtual end provides user controlled isolated Python environment. What this means is that packages are installed directly under a path specified by the user. Uh, once activated, 
a Python uh, a virtual environment Python interpreter precludes uh, some Python or a Python provided by a module. So you need to watch out for some potential for, for conflict and um, make sure that you set up your environment modules that you need before you activate the virtual environment. And uh, in the bottom half of this slide, we have an example recipe of how to build MPI for uh, Pi inside of a virtual environment using proper compiler wrap. Slide 15, a little bit more about virtual environments. It's possible for you to use your packages installed in a virtual environment with an external interpreter. So say one that's provided by one of the software environment modules. Uh, you do this by installing your own packages in your own virtual environment and then um, mixing and matching them using a recipe shown here in Blue XS. Okay, so modifying your script to do this is how you would do that. But you should generally note that packages installed in the virtual environment are going to supersede versions of the package that are installed at the, at the site level, so in a module. Slide 17. The main way of, um, the second main way of customizing that we've seen besides um, building your own is through Conda environment. Uh, the Anaconda distribution, uh, including Intel optimizations, provides the Conda tool. Uh, this is a way to create and update or share environments that are a lot like virtual environments. However, Conda is really incompatible with virtual environments. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, in general, Conda environments replace virtual and Hey, Roland, can I interrupt you for just one second? We're getting yeah. a lot of static, and I want to mute you and see if the static is coming on your end or if it's some, some other problem. So I'm going to mute you for just a second. So I... All right, that's not coming from Roland. It is coming from Roland. Okay. Down my Hey, Roland, I'm going to let you continue. Um, we do have some static on the line, so I'm going to try to figure out what that is. It doesn't look like it's... Um, and also, are you using a mic? I'm using my computer's mic. Okay. All right. So it's possible for me to get closer and get louder, I guess. A little louder would be good. There's a little bit of background noise. I'll try to figure out where it's coming from. Sorry, All right, everyone. Thank All right, thank you. Uh, all right. Conda environments are completely incompatible with virtual environments um, and basically should be considered a replacement for a virtual end. Um, there are a lot of good benefits that come along with that. Of course, a, a number of packages are pre-built and organized into custom channels. In fact, uh, experiments can often organize their own builds of packages into channels, and that way they can standardize their software. Packages. Um, you can leverage your center's Anaconda installation if you have one to create custom environments with the, with the Conda tool um, using Conda, uh, Conda Create. You can also have your own Anaconda or Mini Conda installation. And so there's a little recipe here that will just grab the down, uh, grab the installer for you, um, and you can run it, and then you just activate that by setting a path basically, and then that is your Python environment. And you can also leverage the Intel Python distribution through an Anaconda installation of your own or from an installation at your center using the, the recipe shown there. On slide 18, the way that we provide Python at NERSC is a combination of NERSC Python and the Anaconda distribution. On the Edison Cray XD30 system, we provide both an older NERSC built Python interpreter with a few uh, as a meta, meta package containing a number of scientific Python uh, packages, but also the two versions of the Anaconda distribution. On Cori, we don't build uh, our own in, uh, Python interpreter, but we do provide the Anaconda distribution in two modules. It's possible to build a Conda environment once you've loaded a module on either system using the Anaconda distribution, uh, as shown in the recipe at the bottom of this page as well. Um, at, at Argon, um, the situation is quite a bit different. Uh, every system that's run at Argon is a cross-compile environment except uh, one, which is a data visualization server. And generally, Python, uh, Python distribution and build tools don't play very well with cross-compiling. 
Mira is man has a manually uh, maintained Python installation. Um, instructions are on how to use it are shown there at that path. Modules uh, for Python on that system are built upon request. On Theta, Python is available uh, in one of two ways. One is through the Intel distribution for Python, which is managed uh, via the Conda, uh, Conda tool. And we prefer that, uh, there they prefer that users install their own environment to take charge of them, but also need to observe the rules about um, how to build MPI dependent packages. In addition to the Intel distribution for Python at Argon, Argon manages a Python build uh, through the SPAC uh, package manager and provides a number of, and, and uses the loadable module system through the ALCS Python module. This is a meta module that loads other modules, including NumPy, SciPy, uh, Math Kernel Library, and so on. Um, this is kept up to date with SPAC to emphasize performance and create compatibility. Their virtual environment is recommended. Again, don't try to mix and match this with Honda. Uh, and the policy on, is, uh, on this system is that they will build any package that has a SPAC specification upon request. Slide 20. At Oak Ridge, um, Python is available as uh, Python 279 or Python 3.5 with a number of separate modules providing uh, the scientific Python stack, the basics of the scientific Python stack. Uh, in terms of Anaconda, users are, rec are, are advised to build their own environment, uh, but watch out for conflicts with the Tickle environment module system. Uh, this is because Anaconda brings its own Tickle, I believe. And also, to watch out where you install your packages or your own Anaconda distribution, there are some, there's a better choice in terms of what file system to use, and that is the NFS project space. Okay, slide 21 is where we're going to start talking about single node performance for Python. Are there any questions at this point? Yes, yeah, so I'd like to emphasize that people who are not muted we're not speaking to probably be muted. So right now, um, Roland, we're good. We're still getting some static on the line, um, but I think we're able to hear you okay. Okay. And if there aren't any questions at this point, I'll just move on. Yep, no questions at this point. All right. Slide 22. So when we write high-performance computing code or we write high performance computing Python code, in general, there's kind of a rule of thumb about where we want to, say, spend our time. Okay, we don't want to spend a lot of our time in a Python application actually just running the interpreter. We really like to be crunching numbers. And so that means that we want to be um, pushing operations through the CPU that are taking advantage of the hardware especially vectorization hardware like is present on the nice landing chipset. Um, so the more time that you can spend in loops uh, that can be vectorized, um, then the better performance you're going to get. And fortunately, um, the, well, from the Python level, you're not actually able to do too much about that except make sure, make educated choices about what um, libraries you're using or maybe um, going a step further actually handwriting some C kernels yourself or Fortran kernels yourself that you can compile and see whether or not they vectorize. Above that level or well below that level in the inverted pyramid um, is to make use of uh, thread level parallelism or MPI parallelism within a node when it makes sense. And above that, to achieve scalability up to the scale of the entire machine, you need to use something that can go off the node and generally the answer there in high performance codes is MPI. And beyond that, it's up to you how you manage your workflow. Slide 23. So I mentioned earlier this uh, feature of Python called the global interpreter lock, also known as the GIL. Uh, this is a feature of CPython, which is the primary implementation of Python. To keep memory coherent, it only allows a single thread to run in the interpreter's memory space at once. Um, and so the, the GIL is the thing that enforces this. The controversial feature, as I mentioned before, but it isn't all bad. Maybe it gets a bad rap. It's mostly sidestep for I.O. It makes writing modules in C much easier. It makes maintaining the interpreter code base a lot easier. 
and it encourages the development of other paradigms or other approaches to parallelism than threads directly at the at the Python level. And it's almost entirely irrelevant in the HPC space because it doesn't impact the use of MPI or the use of threads that are embedded in pre-compiled modules. But the, the GIL is a topic of active discussion in the Python community and especially in the Python parallelism community. And there are a number of talks about it, including uh, this gory details talk by Dave Bees. Of all the thing that you can do to improve the parallelism of your Python code, scientific Python codes, is to use threaded libraries. Building blocks like NumPy and SciPy are already built with MPI to be compatible with MPI and provide thread support through BLAS and LAPAC and the Intel Math kernel library. Um, it's advised that, that developers should probably not um, undertake a project like re-implementing solvers in pure Python. Uh, work with NumPy and SciPy to get your math done. Many of your favorite threaded libraries and packages already have bindings. Um, those in the HPC world will probably be able to figure out what some of these are. Um, PyTrilino, Petsy for Pi, uh, the Elemental um, Linear Algebra package has a set of Python bindings, but I don't think that they're documented all that well. And, and uh, um, slide 25. There are a number of ways that you can build and compile in um, your own code. Um, and here are a few of the of the most popular ways of doing that. Um, this includes Python and SuPy, which we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, PyBind 11, Swig is probably one of the older ones, Boost, uh, Unity types. And of course, writing bindings yourself directly in C or C++. Um, personally, I do this uh, more than I would use Python. That's simply because I know C a lot better than I know Python. But getting it to work right can be kind of uh, difficult. But I recommend this really nice uh, blog post about how to write your own C bindings from Dan uh, Foreman Mackey. About uh, it's a really nice, extensive blog post about how to do it. Right. How we, so Python is kind of an in-between step between writing Python code and C extensions, and a lot of people find it easier than, than writing C extensions by hand. And it actually provides uh, pretty good speed ups, um, up to 12 times. Um, it builds on Python syntax, um, so it's not all of that unfamiliar. You add a few um, type declarations. Basically, by being more explicit about type, you can get Python to perform a bit better. It translates input.pyx files into C, which are then um, compiled. Um, there are a number of interfaces, actually, that Python is compatible with. You can use OpenMP, uh, talk directly to CPython, NumPy, arrays, and much more. Um, and one thing that's worth mentioning is that it's another way that you can suspend the GIL if you want to. So here's, a, here's an example uh, showing on the left a uh, relatively simple Python code for calculating pi using a Monte Carlo technique. And uh, I believe that these yellow lines are generated in um, uh, IPython notebook. He is saying C Python magic, or Python magic. So that's pretty neat. Um, on the right hand side is an annotated version with additional uh, additional directives that are um, part of uh, Python. So here we're, we're talking about what types variables are and um, being more explicit about spending the gill. And uh, this the code on the right actually expands into a huge um, C source file that um, forms a lot better than the code, the pure Python code on the left. Uh, F2Py, um, no HPC talk would be complete without at least a little bit of Fortran in it. Uh, F2Py provides a way to build in Fortran subroutines or functions into, into Python applications, and it's really pretty simple. Um, here's an example of basically the same function to do the Monte Carlo calculation. And then at the bottom is a F2Py um, invocation that builds a Python module or a module that's accessible from Python called CalcPy Fortran and then demonstrates how you call that um, on, the, on the bottom. You simply import that module and then you can call that function. Um, when working with Py Fortran extensions, it's important to be aware of the layout and the type parameters of the NumPy arrays that you may be passing into it. If the layout of the NumPy array is a Fortran layout and it has an understood Fortran type, 
then that's just done by normal pass by reference that Fortran loves. If not, what's done is a contiguous copy is made and a pointer to that is made and passed to the Fortran function. So that's a consequence for whether or not you make changes to the argument that's been passed in and whether or not you expect um, uh, expect to have intent in out for that argument or not. So if you make modifications to such arrays, um, then they're not going to be, they're not going to appear after the call. So how do you decide when it's time to start um, optimizing your code or maybe writing some C extensions or refactoring how you're using the NumPy, uh, NumPy array syntax and uh, broadcasting rules? A really simple tool that you can start using basically on your laptop outside of an HPC context is a standard module library called cProfile. This is a low overhead profiler and uh, it outputs statistics on what your code is actually doing in terms of how many times various functions are called, uh, how much time is spent in various functions, how much time is spent per function call, and so on. And I'll mention that cProfile being one of the standard library um, is, one of, is one of the main standard library profiling um, tool. Uh, there are other ones out there. There's line profiler, which is a line by line profiler, and there's also a memory profiler, which helps you understand your, your memory consumption. And these are basically just pure Python tools that are available that you can download and install on any system yourself. Um, profi uh, C profile generates output in terms of tables of statistics, which are kind of boring to look at. SnakeViz is an, a nifty visualization tool that allows you to visualize C profile output in a web browser. Um, this basically reports the same statistics mentioned above, but you're able to interact with the table, and sort by number of calls or amount of time spent or cumulative time spent in some function. There are a few different ways of viewing your, uh, where your code is spending its time. Um, so they're shown on the right there, this kind of circle one and then maybe a more familiar kind of icicle or I guess a flame graph maybe. You can also visualize the call stack, so what is being called and where in your application um, through a, a call stack and you can drill down into that just a little bit. Using it is very simple. You, you just take whatever pro program you've got and you uh, patch in the C profile module, take the output from that and pass it to SnakeViz and then a web server, a, a, web, a little web server starts up and in your web browser, you can start interacting with the output from cProfile. On slide 30, um, we talk about VTune. Uh, if you start looking at uh, how your code is actually executing in terms of threads, or you want a bit more detail than you can get uh, from cProfile and SnakeViz, or you want to be sure that you're actually using um, counters effectively, uh, VTune is uh, really a great tool that's been developed by Intel over a number of years. And in just the past year, um, compatibility with Python code uh, has been added to VTune. Um, so VTune is really kind of the bread and butter of what we use um, at a lot of high performance computing centers um, where it makes sense to, to optimize and analyze code. Um, it has both a GUI and command line interface that you can use and it provides Inter interfaces for thread timelines, analyzing hotspots in your code, um, memory profiling, seeing where your code is hanging out, waiting for its thread buddies to, to catch up. Uh, you can also interact with the timeline that, that you can see in the, in the picture there, zooming in and filtering out events so that you can um, analyze particular parts of the code that are uh, maybe working slowly. Um, there are some words of advice here about using Intel VTune. Um, First of all is that uh, the GUI is great, but you've got to run it over a remote desktop. Uh, using it over X connection is simply not viable. Um, so if you have a remote desktop um, application at the HPC center you're at, like NX, like we have at NERSC, then that's the recommended way of using it. VTune is part of a larger package called Intel Parallel Studio, and that, that may be available as a module. Uh, VTune is available at NERSC as a module just with module load VTune, you have to remember to add one flag to when you launch a job. But then once you're inside the job, you, you, run, uh, you run the collector and then you can analyze it using the GUI in a separate, uh, uh, in a separate session. Now with um, architectures like KNL, um, it's recommended, there are a few best practices, actually quite a few best practices with uh, using VTune on KNL. 
the most important one is not to, is to avoid finalizing the results on KNL. Rather, it's recommended to archive those and finalize on a different architecture. Usually, this is not a problem because file systems can be shared. Um, and the results can be moved around or just stored in a directory. Um, there's a link at the bottom of this uh, slide that, that provides a few more best practices on using VTune uh, on KNL. On slide 31, I'll just mention briefly that there's there are other tools available from Intel uh, um, that also now work with Python code. Intel Advisor being one, Advisor actually tells you what you might want to try to do to optimize your C extensions points out opportunities for vectorization and threads in your C code. Um, but we're not going to talk too much about that because, of course, this is a Python talk. Um, maybe uh, maybe in the future it would be an interesting topic for the IDEAS webinar to talk about optimizing Python code more in detail. Um, I'll mention also that the Intel Advisor provides a roofline analysis, which is also an upcoming IDEAS webinar topic. You can see when to stop. Um, are you if your memory bandwidth bound or compute bound, what can you do to, to, to change things to where you want them to be? All right. So slide 32 is the breakpoint. This is where I'm going to hand off to William. But before we do that, I'm curious if there are any questions. There are a couple here. Okay, great. So one of them is um, Do you think Vtune or Alinge is better? So, um, I haven't actually used Linnea tools to try to profile Python code. I'm just aware that uh, Vtune works with Python code. So I haven't got a lot of experience with the Linnea tools with respect to Python. So, uh, William, do you have any comments? So I, I've used both Linnea's map and I've used uh, Tau. Um, and I, I very honestly think Vtune, Alinea map, and how all have their advantages. Advantages. Um, if, if I were to go into them, we'd be here all night. Um, I think the biggest advantage that I can say for Tau of the three is Tau's license is an open source license. Um, Alinea seems to do a little bit of a better job of integrating MPI into their tracing um, than Vtune does. Um, on the other hand, Vtune seems to be improving in functionality very, very quickly. Um, there's been a lot of improvements even between the 2017 and 2018 data. So um, my general suggestion is to try and try uh, the try them and see what kind of is best. Um, each center, I think, also has uh, particular tools that they support one more than the other in their environment, and I think that also really factors into which to choose. Okay. Another one here is, uh, I don't know if you'd like to elaborate on uh, What is the main advantage of using Python What is the main advantage of using Python in HPC? That's a good question. So, of course, the question is, like, what is the advantage relative to what? Okay. So, I would say that if I was going to try to write an application that was, you know, aimed at achieving high performance and I wanted to make sure that I was in total control of whether or not how I was going to do the optimizations, then I'm probably going to pick another tool besides Python uh, like C or C++ uh, or Fortran to write that application. Um, also, though, I would elaborate on that and say, though, that, um, you know, after writing a lot of Python code, you very quickly get uh, kind of frustrated with the difficulty of uh, um, not being able to identify tools within easy reach to do sometimes very simple tasks. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, this is kind of a frustration barrier that that can keep people in Python when, when maybe to achieve the highest level of performance, they might need to, to go elsewhere. So I would say that in terms of application design, it's possible to design interface layers that play Python strings um, that sit on top of relatively large, uh, highly optimized code bases in C or C++ uh, that, that achieve performance. And so there are an, examples of code that, that do that, and I think there are going to be more examples of code that do that because simply because scientists uh, who are really not familiar with the ins and outs of vectorization and threading still 
and do something functional with the Python layer. And I think that this is an interesting paradigm. So the final question for this, uh, last question for this break. Uh, any thoughts on using PyCharm over, over Jupyter? See, this is the thing about giving a Python talk, is that people always talk about their favorite tool and ask why you didn't mention it. So I'm waiting for the PyPy question or, you know, anything else like that. Um, I don't have any thoughts about Py, uh, PyCharm over Jupyter. Uh, I actually am a huge fan of, of Jupyter and never use PyCharm myself. Uh, how about you, William or Matt? Um. I'm in the, uh, the same boat. I've, I've never used, uh, I've not made use of uh, PyCharm very extensively, but uh, I use Jupyter on an almost daily basis. All right. So um, maybe, William, you want to you wanna take over now? And sure. you can just say to change the slide, and I'll go ahead and change it for you. Okay. So we, uh, we're on slide 33. So why MPI? Uh, with Python. Um, for the most part, in the HPC context, it's still the HPC paradigm for inter-process and inter-node communication. Um, you'll see other things like DASP. You'll see folks running Spark and Hadoop um, and using that very successfully with Python. Uh, but for the most part, if you're trying to get the most advantage out of the supercomputer, um, you're going to be, and it's interconnect and it's fancy parallel file systems, um, it's going to be MPI and MPIO that lets you get the performance out. Um, there's very well supported tools for parallel development with but even when you're using Python. Uh, the Intel tools come to mind, again, PAL. Um, for the most part, because C Python is C, um, I've had decent luck with using using Alinea's total view, uh, sorry, using total view, uh, using the Alinea tools. Um, and the one other thing is it's not a new thing. People have been writing Python MPI bindings since 1996, um, if not later. Uh, moving to the slide 34. So at one point there was about six or seven different Python bindings to choose from, but at this point in history, um, just about everyone has settled on MPI for Pi. And kind of the way we got there is that it's a very Pythonic wrapping of the system's native MPI. That means things like exceptions, type conversions, are handled in a way that generally aren't much of a surprise to Python users. Um, it's very well maintained. The maintainer was on Dalton. Usually turns around questions and bugs within a couple of days. Um, it's distributed with all the major Python distributions. It doesn't matter if you're using Intel Python, Anaconda, uh, Intel Canopy, um, SPAC, you're basically guaranteed to have easy support for it. It's portable and scalable. Um, for effective use, the only things that you really need are NumPy, which you don't actually need to build MPI for Pi, Cyclone for building, and the system MPI. Um, it's highly scalable. We've taken up to all cores um, on all of our, uh, the systems here at ALCF. Um, and really, your capabilities for MPI with MPI for Pi are only limited by the uh, system in the system MPI. Uh, moving on to slide 35. Running MPI for pie jobs, just like running any other MPI binary. Um, you've got your run job or S run with its parameters, the Python that you intend to run, and then a path to your script. One of the nice things about MPI for Pi uh, for people who are afraid about adding in MPI support to things that are currently serial is that if you just run uh, with a plain Python interpreter um, on your desktop or a single node, um, it should, everything should just work transparently. Uh, things that can become important to remember is that you wind up with an independent Python interpreter launched per MPI rank. Um, this means that there's no automatic shared memory, there's no shared file handles or objects, and no shared state between these interpreters. Um, like any other MPI program, um, if the, you do something that crashes the interpreter or crashes inside of a C or Fortran module, um, you lose the entire, uh, lose the entire uh, run. One thing that's 
actually relatively common um, in two of the projects that I've worked on. The one that most people are a little more familiar with is uh, GPy that we it's possible to embed it, the Python interpreter within a C or C++ program and use MPI for Py from within that environment as well. Uh, things back and forth between C and the Python has. Um, when things go wrong, it's important to remember that C Python is just a C binary and MPI for Py is just a binding uh, for whatever your native system MPI is. So whatever you're using to debug in standard C code, you can carry forward. Um, this means that you'll can get core files. On the downside, when you're running in parallel with MPI for Py and you're crashing, if you're issuing exceptions, um, you can wind up with highly mainly stack traces. Um, other things that tend to go wrong, uh, particularly with a lot of prepackaged environments, is you might be linked against the wrong MPI. And depending on your operating system, you can use LD or OTool on the Mac uh, to see what you've linked against. Um, the next big thing that usually happens is making sure that you're using the same Python and MPI for Pi uh, and that code and the libraries that you're using are available on all nodes. Uh, from there, I usually try to take things down to debugging with a single rank and from there, rebuilding uh, Python and A and the C modules that I built with debugging symbols. Uh, moving on to slide 36. Um, MPI for Pi, if you just do, it, you'll see in a lot of people's MPI for Pi codes, um, from MPI for Pi import MPI. Um, if you just import MPI for Pi, there's the MPI for Pi dot RC uh, method, which allows you to set things like thread level and turn on and off automatic initialization. And this is important because if you just do the from MPI for Pi import MPI, it'll automatically call MPI in it. And if you're embedding inside of a larger program, or you're using it with uh, modules that may have already initialized MPI, uh, calling MPI and calling init or init thread more than once will, is a violation of the MPI standard and can lead to an exception, which is the best case, or an abort if you're using C and C++ modules. So it's important to test for it. Is it, it use, is initialized for initialization that sort of situation. Uh, moving to slide, slide 37, similarly for shutdown, uh, the, if you if just delete, if you just end your program, um, MPI fine life will automatically be called when the interpreter exits. And it, again, if you're in a case where you're embedding, it's uh, generally a good idea to use is fine life to test for initialization, to test for finalization. Um, because again, calling finalize more than once will, it will uh, it almost always crash and exit with an error. Uh, moving to slide 38, uh, program structure is relatively straightforward. In this case, we're just doing a hello world. Uh, we've got uh, at our line one, we've done it for, from MPI for Pi, import MPI. So uh, MPI init is called Taurus. We take one of the default in the default communicator, Tom World. We get a rank. We get the size of the MPI Tom World. And then uh, one thing that's that's important, just like in C plus C C plus plus or Fortran, is unless you directed something in an if or another control statement to only occur on a certain node or a certain community group of, of nodes by communicators, um, you will run up routines on all nodes. So in this case, we should expect to see a hello from an even rank from only even ranks, so a module of two equaling zero. All of those ranks should output because we've got a barrier. And then uh, we should say goodbye from all ranks. So moving for, uh, forward to uh, slide 39, one of the things that are important to think about uh, with MPI for Pi are data types. Um, buffers, memory buffers, MPI data types, and NumPy objects aren't pickled. Uh, they're transmitted near the same speed as C or C++ code. NumPy data types are automatically converted to MPI data types, though for um, other data structures that might be considered that, um, if you think about them, they're just buffers. 
would like to describe them as uh, a, a two three list or a tuple structure with the name of the buffer followed by the data type or single item. Or if you have multiple items, the buffer, its size, and then the data type. Um, any sort of custom MPI data type that you can think of can be created via MPI for Pi and passed on that way. One important thing is in order to get that speed and avoid pickling, you have to use the capital letter version of methods. Any other object, any sort of Python uh, object that you've created um, will wind up being pickled and unpickled. And the ability to send those objects depend on uh, Python's ability to pickle them. So if you have things like open handles or things that underneath contain some sort of pointer, um, they may not be pickle pickleable. Um, and those use the lowercase methods. There will be an exception if you try to send an object that requires pickling using the uppercase method. Um, one of the things is just when in doubt, ask if what you're sending can be represented as a memory buffer or as a C data type or only as a Pi object. So moving forward to slide 39. Um, the, again, MPI for Pi, you have same two default communicators. One hard lesson learned from a number of people is that for safety, it's always a good idea to duplicate communicators uh, before use with libraries and modules you didn't write. Um, there's always a chance that someone will change the geometry or the content of a communicator within their library. And as that represented as a pointer underneath, um, that means that what you expect to be inside of a communicator might be changed. The only place where MPI for Pi breaks really with the MPI standards are it provides a method called isInter and isIntra. So that way, if you're using comspawn, um, you can figure out if something is an intercommunicator or an intracommunicator. Um, moving to slide 41. Um, just as an example, and I apologize for the size of the text, uh, just showing that what happens it, when you're using collectives and operations, um, if you're operating collectives on um, Python objects, they're incredibly naive. For example, if you use a scatter um, on a Python dictionary, um, you will only actually wind up scattering out the keys. If you wind up doing a, uh, a sum, well, using sum on uh, an all reduce, you wind up, well, on a reduce, you wind up with um, this concatenation, which is probably not what you're expecting. Um, one other disadvantage to do any of the collective operations and the reduction operations on Python objects is in general it serializes. So whereas your underlying MPI may have all sorts of clever methods uh, for doing fast uh, collectives and fast uh, collective operations, you'll find yourself uh, with a relatively slow reduction or collective method. Um, and again, the casing convention applies to any of the collective methods. So moving forward to slide 42. Um, one important note is that general Python IO, just like general POSIX IO, is not multi-thread MPI state. Um, if you have multiple, uh, multiple ranks or multiple threads opening a file, and they're all doing I.O. at once, uh, there's a good chance that you will clobber your I.O. Um, when you're using H5Pi, which is actually incredibly common uh, throughout the Python community, as it's used in a lot of, uh, uses one of the underlying data stores uh, for Pi tables and for uh, pandas, um, is relatively common to encounter um, prepackaged H5Pi built without MPI support. However, if you import H5Pi and you call it git config method.mpi, um, if it is built with MPI, yeah, you, it'll return true. Um, this is uh, really important. Um, when you're using H5Pi, you must make sure that your MPI for Pi and the MPI CC that was used uh, to compile H HDF5 and MPI for Pi and H5Pi all must match. 
So if you're in an environment with multiple compilers and multiple MPIs, um, you, you should check before uh, check to make sure that everything was compiled with the same compilers and the same MPI before proceeding. However, once everything is compiled and installed, it is a relatively simple operation just to call in the MPI IO driver um, and use H5Pi as you would use HCF5 in any other language. One large caveat that um, I've seen trip people up is that when you're using H5Pi in parallel, you've got to make sure that any changes that you make to the file structure or file, the internal file metadata um, must be performed on all ranks that have the file open. Um, this is because it, this uh, tends to trip people up when they're uh, creating sets or moving things around within an HDF5 file and trying to do it on one rank while it's open on many ranks. Um, moving forward to slide 43, one of the most important things that uh, trips people up in Ritz Python performance is uh, Python uh, is the problem of loading Python at scale. Uh, Python's import statement is incredibly metadata intensive. Um, every time you do say import uh, numkey, um, there is a search the whole up and down your entire Python path, as well as through the site packages list to find uh, to find it. And then once it finds uh, numpy or any other module, it then proceeds to do a series of stat calls. Uh, to compare the versionings and timings of .py and .pycs and .pyos. Um, even if you're using compiled modules, the metadata overhead of loading uh, shared libraries uh, is uh, incredibly high. The more processes you have, the worse this becomes. On NFS file systems, this generally it completely serializes, um, making load times absolutely impossible. And there are solutions. Uh, there's been projects such as Shifter with containers that uh, take metadata calls off of the parallel file systems and off of uh, and keeps them local. There are the ability to cache LD, the cache the LD library path via LD config. Um, there's projects like uh, Python MPI broadcasts uh, that allow for the shipping of software stack out the compute nodes before your actual job begins. There's the ability to install into uh, local shared memory file systems. And then there are projects like Spindle for scalable shared library loading, um, all of which help. Uh, moving on to 44, um, do we have any uh, questions? Yeah, we did have one. Um, Somebody asks, uh, and I couldn't answer this correctly because I don't have uh, much experience with uh, uh, parallel works. Um, they're now using Joblib for parallel works, and they ask, uh, what are the major disadvantages of Joblib compared to MPI for Pi? And uh, I don't know if either of, uh, of you uh, at NERSC or LCF or someone else on the line um, have experience with that and can answer the question. Um. What is the tool? I, I, I'm sorry. Joblib. So at NERSC, we've seen people successfully use Joblib, but um, we haven't had, uh, we don't have a large number of users that are actually using Joblib. I would say that in terms of alternatives to MPI for Pi, um, people are a bit reluctant to, uh, at this point, to, to really uh, embrace alternatives like uh, Dask uh, or Spark or uh, job lib uh, or similar similar sorts of things. One thing that we often do see though is people writing their own um, schemes for uh, achieving throughput computing, like by leveraging MPI for pi stack. So, most of our experiences with MPI for pi, I would say here. Yeah, as I was about to say, the usual advantage versus other tools that MPI for pi gives you is that most of the other tools wind up sitting on top of uh, TCP IP. And so you lose the advantages that you get with uh, HPC Interconnect. To that, I would add that it depends on 
depends on the context. It's uh, maybe you're just sending job metadata around. MPI for Pi is a little bit of overkill. Um, but actually, even just getting onto using TCP can be kind of difficult in some places. But if you are moving large data sets around, like really big arrays, or distributed linear algebra, you need to use MPI for Pi. Is there, I guess there's another question on the chat, which is about whether or not we're going to support Numba as an alternative to Python or f Pi. Uh, in terms of using Numba, you can do it uh, fairly easily. Um, so we don't have a, um, uh, there's, there's no restriction as far as I know about um, using Numba. So um, any further questions that I would like to write in the chat? Otherwise, would like to wrap up? Uh, there might be one more question. Um, are there, uh, I, I can only speak for the, the OLCF about uh, supporting Jupyter. Uh, I know uh, NERSC provides a, um, a, uh, a Jupyter dev service. Um, does the ALCF have any plans uh, to, to provide Jupyter or Jupyter Hub instances uh, to users? Uh, yes, actually, um, uh, we actually expect to have something up and uh, publicly available later uh, later this summer. I'll add to that that. As, as Matt mentioned, we do have, um, we actually have two, two services running. One is uh, running on an external node, which can see our file system. Uh, that's the main jupyter.nurse.gov uh, uh, service. We also have one that is actually running on, uh, that launches notebook servers on the Cori, uh, on a Cori login node, basically. And this summer, we're working on expanding the service so that users can run notebooks and kernels on uh, compute nodes uh, within Cori. Uh, so one would obtain an interactive allocation and launch a notebook and be able to use it for a long period of time and have a compute node. Actually, bring the last slide. Oops. All right, so we'll just conclude by saying that uh, we're going to, uh, we, we welcome Python users uh, at our at our facilities, and we want to point out that getting started is as easy as module load, but that from there you can take it pretty far in terms of customization. Uh, we hope we've provided some guidance and talked about best practices to help you improve your Python experience in the HPC context. We really encourage you to try out profiling and performance analysis tools that we've discussed here, and if you get stuck with them, contact us and ask for help. Um, in closing, we'll say that th while there are a lot of challenges for Python and HPC, uh, if we work together with users and vendors, then there can be many rewards for using Python and HPC. One more question here. Uh, uh, can you say a word about this book? Sure. Um, so, uh, William mentioned Shifter when he was talking about the slow launch problem for Python. Um, Shifter is, uh, is a container, uh, container for HPC tools which, uh, where you can build the Docker container and then ship the Docker container to the compute center and then run that on a compute node. Um, the way that we generally set up Python inside of a Docker container is that you, know, you get your own Linux distribution inside the Docker container and you can use the package management tools that come with that. And it's right. However, to take advantage of libraries like MPI, it's important to, 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 be, to, to consult the documentation on how to actually take advantage of the, of the Cray MPI library. So I can address doing that here at NERSC Can we have documentation on how to build MPI inside of a container so that it's compatible with the Cray and pitch interface. And on top of that, building MPI for Pi is no problem. And of course, this is our primary method of telling users how to how to scale up their Python um, applications if they run into the slow launch problem. It's really the best way to go. Okay. Okay, with that, I think we I don't see any further questions here. We'd like to close this webinar. Thank you all for uh, 
participating. Uh, we uh, like so. Let's, um, So this is the post slide, so please give us your feedback. We would uh, like to improve the series of webinars. Uh, uh, um, so this is slides and the recording as well will be soon available in this address that you see there in this last, last slide. Same time. Yeah, uh, just use it. Uh, yes or not? Sir. 